Welcome to Citizens Climate Radio. In this show, we highlight people's stories. We celebrate your successes, and together we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peterson Toscano. Welcome to Episode 54 of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of Citizens Climate Education. This episode is airing on Friday, November 27th, 2020. In this episode, you will hear some trash talk. Well, someone talking about trash. As the coronavirus pandemic shut everything down, Sharona Schneider just couldn't stay inside any longer. So one Tuesday, she joined a friend at a neighborhood park. Together, while socially distant, they picked up trash. This one outing has led to an international movement called Tuesdays for Trash. Sharona shares how picking up trash is bringing people together, lifting spirits, and most importantly, getting people engaged in climate work. But first, let's talk athletic eco-action. Lou Blaustein, the host of the Green Sports Pod, recently interviewed a professional football player who's giving back to his community in an innovative and substantial way. I was riveted by the story of Gary Gilliam. I told Lou that my audience would probably find it inspiring, so he gave me permission to rebroadcast an edited version of his episode about Gary Gilliam. Ah, the twists and turns that made Gilliam the athlete and the community leader he is today. I share with you this excerpt from the Green Sports Pod. I then follow up with Gary Gilliam myself to find out what's been happening since the pandemic lockdown. Gilliam was being raised by a struggling single mom in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Harrisburg is the epitome of, of systematic oppression in terms of the, the funding for schools. Obviously, that comes from property values. The, the homeowner rate is extremely low in Harrisburg. Most people are only renting. The school district for the capital of Pennsylvania is ranked 496 of 498 school districts. It's a food desert. There's one grocery store in the entire city limits of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. When I was eight years old, I was actually put into a private boarding school and not your typical boarding school. This boarding school was founded for orphans back in 1909 by the great chocolatier Milton Hershey. It was actually founded for little white orphan boys in 1909. Through the civil rights movement in the 60s, black males were admitted through the 70s and 80s, females were admitted. And by the time that I went in the late 90s, it was no longer just for orphans, but for financially needy families, families below the poverty line, single parent homes, still your orphans, foster kids that are in bad situations, things like that. So kids that don't have the environment nor the resources to fulfill their potential. It's a completely cost-free school. They pay for your housing, your food, schooling. And the best part about it is once you graduate, they actually pay for college. The different extra co-curricular activities that they had allowed me, one, to distract myself from missing my mom, but then two, it allowed me to become well-rounded and and I learned that I was actually pretty good at a few of these different things. So I was exposed to them and then that was nurtured. So I grew into the beautiful plant, you know, that I was supposed to be. He played well as a tight end in football to the point that he attracted the interest of several top Division I college programs. One would think that the next cut of Gilliam would be of him waxing poetic about the value of athletics as an on-ramp to a better life for African Americans. In fact, he has a different perspective. It's pitched as an opportunity for African Americans to break a generational curse, but in reality, it, it almost reaffirms it. And that a little black boy in the hood is only ever told that the only way you get out is to be an athlete, a rapper, or a drug dealer. Despite his ambivalence, Gilliam realized that he loved playing football and that if things went well at whatever college he chose, he had a chance to make it to the NFL. Multiple schools offered Gilliam scholarships. He chose to go to Penn State. On the field, Gilliam played well as a freshman, but as a sophomore, he suffered a horrific injury, a tear of his ACL, MCL, and PCL, basically exploding his knee. That led to a rehab that was beyond arduous. I remember calling back to Milton Hershey, actually, to Mrs. Ainsworth. She was our junior chapel leader, and she picked up the phone, and I just started crying. 
I was just in such a dark place of, of no hope and just there was no way to get out of it. And like, I remember saying like, what have I done in my life to deserve this stuff? Like I've always been someone who's been by the book and doing good things. Why is this happening to me? And her being a super religious person, the way she explained it was, as we've all heard, God gives the hardest battles to the strongest soldiers. And I was like, you know what, this is all this anguish and all this hurt, all these things, something's on the end of this. It's carving my character for something but the injury had cost him some of his speed, and speed was his special sauce as a tight end, and maybe his ticket to the NFL. Gilliam ultimately realized that, while he might have just average speed for an NFL tight end prospect, he would still be considered fast, if light, as an offensive tackle. Switching positions like that near the end of one's college career was almost unheard of, and thinking about what my future would be, I was like, look, I can either try and make it to the NFL as an average athletic tight end, or I can try and convince my coach to allow his starting tight end in one of the most pivotal positions in his offense to switch to offensive tackle to give myself a better shot. Again, forward thinking to make it into the NFL. His head coach, Bill O'Brien, now in the same role with the NFL's Houston Texans, agreed to the switch. Since there wasn't much tape of Gilliam playing tackle for NFL scouts to digest, there was a lot of pressure on him on his pro day. When scouts from 31 of the 32 teams came to Penn State to test him on all sorts of drills, the one team that didn't come, the defending Super Bowl champion Seattle Seahawks, they worked him out privately. You think doing a workout would be, you know, running, pushing, doing all this stuff. But while I'm doing like kick slides and such, Coach is like, all right, asking me questions like, what kind of car do you have? What year is it? What's the model? What's your mom's little name? Like that fast. As you're moving, like he was, he's like, I want to see if you can move and think on your feet. And I'm like, well, I'm about this. Like, I like this, this mental stuff. I'm down. Then the draft came and went. Because of his injury history and his lack of history at tackle, all 32 teams passed on Gilliam over all seven rounds. Gilliam and his agent began working the phones during the post-draft maelstrom known as undrafted free agency, where the best eligible undrafted players try to find a team that will sign them as a long shot candidate to make the squad and training camp. For Gilliam, that team was the Seattle Seahawks. Once he got to training camp, he knew the odds were against him. It's like you're at the bottom of the totem pole again. It's super vulnerable. You don't really know what's going on. You're just trying to figure things out. And then to make it worse, they did just win a Super Bowl and I am an undrafted player, which means they got very good players and they probably don't need to sign me. <laughs> and there's other players in my class they drafted at my position. <laughs> so I got a long road ahead of me, but like, all right, let's go. Let's put our head down. Let's show the coaches we're coachable. Every day before practice, I would ask coach, what's one thing you want me to work on today? And I would follow up after practice, like how did it look? I do it again tomorrow. Let's focus. Like, you know, so I was very intentional with what I was doing. Every little bit, every day, every day, every day. Gilliam originally was a tight end. He had the ability to catch passes as well as block. Each week, the Seahawks would practice a different trick play in which an offensive lineman would be used as an eligible receiver to surprise the defense. If the play worked as dialed up, no one would cover the lineman until it was too late. And then all he has to do is catch the ball. That is, if the play is called, which it wasn't all season long. Until the NFC Championship, the Green Bay Packers against the Seattle Seahawks in Seattle. The winner would go to Super Bowl 49 versus Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. The Seahawks were struggling, down 16-0 to the Packers in the third quarter. The crowd at CenturyLink Field was deathly quiet. Seattle finally got a drive going, but it stalled. Time to try a field goal to make the score 16-3 and get back into the game a bit. That's when they called for the fake. They had run this play in practice just that week, and Gilliam dropped the ball. Gilliam hadn't had a pass thrown to him in a game, much less caught one in years. If the play failed, the odds were very strong that Seattle's season would end one game short of the Super Bowl. 60,000 plus people in the stands and 50 million or so people on TV would be watching. I release and I'm running and like I kind of like run toward the linebacker pretend like I was about to block him just kind of like mosey toward him and he took the bait he like dodged me like he was trying to avoid a block and went to run toward John I'm like oh got him the John Gilliam refers to is the holder for the field goal who becomes the passer on the play looked over my shoulder and I was like all right where's the ball at and John was kind of late on it so I kind of had to lag a little bit caught it looked it in tucked it away and scored a touchdown 
the crowd went absolutely bonkers. There's an image in Sports Illustrated, a double page of it, of me scoring my touchdown and like yelling. And you can just see all the fans just like, ah! I just remember yelling and my teammates jumping on me. It was awesome. And the Seahawks ended up winning in sudden death overtime. After three more seasons with the Seahawks, Gilliam moved over to the division rival San Francisco 49ers in 2017. And while Gilliam, who last played in the NFL in 2018, is still open to returning to the league if the situation is right, his main focus is on the Bridge Eco Village, sustainable mixed use inner city developments where people of color and other underserved communities will have the opportunity to work eat, live, learn, and play. Gilliam is looking to tackle three related massive societal problems, systemic oppression and racism, hopelessness and homelessness, food deserts, and other forms of environmental and climate degradation. So the Bridge Eco Village is a culmination of a few different things, five different branches, work, eat, live, learn, and play. Each of those five branches are attacking a different problem in our society. So, what Gilliam is envisioning with the Bridge Eco Village is a new, equitable, healthy, environmentally sustainable system that will ultimately oust the oppressive incumbent system. But by not just talking about it, not blaming it on somebody, but you set up a system that just empowers people. It's providing them with the education, the resources, the food, the incubation, the synergy of humans being together, teaching the skills they need to. And then we see where we all get when we reach the top of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that self-actualization. You want to give the best of you back to society. You can't even talk about that before you take care of food, shelter, water, safety, security, love and belong. you got to create the environment before you start talking about the spiritual thing, what it means to be a man or a woman or a god. It's a public-private partnership. You know, these projects take a lot of money. So being able to get money in from private investors, using that money to also capture public grants, so be getting some public money, but then also doing some crowdfunding from people in the community that want to be involved and give their resources towards some things. So it's a combination of, of all those. And a lot of the main investors that we target, so I'll speak on Harrisburg first, so like myself, Jordan Hill, Noah Spence, some of these professional athletes that have come out of Harrisburg are some of the first ones that we contact. One, because they've got the financial means, hopefully. And two, because it's also a cultural shift. We want athletes and entertainers to be the one that push this entrepreneurial shift in, in a mindset of our culture, if you will. We always let everybody that's involved with the bridge know this is always going to be about people over profit, but there is a way to do both together. Since Lou's interview with Gary, much has changed in the world. At the moment, Gary Gilliam is taking a break from professional football. Instead, he uses his energy, drive, and education to address big issues in an ambitious way. And like everyone, the pandemic with its shutdown has affected Gary. Well, it's impacted a lot of other people's lives, and being an empathetic person, it certainly impacts mine that way. Fortunately, haven't had any unfortunate circumstances, you know, within my close circle. I'm kind of a hermit anyway and don't really leave my house and have my gym here, so I work out at home. <laughs> it's given me a lot of time with my daughter, who is 10 months old, so it was kind of good timing for that to be home and be around her and watch her develop, help mom with a lot of things. And what about the bridge? I worry that it might be on hold during this strange period when momentum on many projects has slowed or stopped altogether. But in terms of the bridge, it's it's actually kind of accelerated what we're doing there more than anything else is just because of COVID and the racial tension and everything going on right now has just kind of magnified a lot of the issues that the bridge was made to solve. It's kind of been perfect timing for the bridge to be there, to be that answer for a lot of different areas. Gary recognizes injustices in certain neighborhoods over time have been practically set in stone. Ongoing injustices get passed on with each generation. If you just trace back Black history, which is American history and slavery and Jim Crow laws and the civil rights movement, there were legitimately laws put in place that kept Black families from buying homes and areas. If you look at anybody who's wealthy, their main source of wealth is through real estate. 
if you stop that with those early families, someone's great, great grandfather, maybe not had the, the house itself, but had the opportunity to have that house, allowed them to lay the foundation for true generational wealth generations later. For a big, thorny, deep-rooted problem. Systematic oppression. Gary has set in motion big solutions. The bridge is creating systematic empowerment, not pinpointing anybody or any group of people or anything like that. Anybody who needs resources, poor people, the bottom 99% who through school you're taught to be an employee, not necessarily a, a boss. Well, here's a way to, to get you know, resources and an opportunity to, to develop that side of your being. So you don't have to be financially dependent on somebody else. You can start to create financial independence. Here we go. To destroy those generational curses. <laughs> Gary has ambitious plans for the Bridge Eco Village, including implementing systems and practices that create growth without creating pollution. Create kind of like what's called a smart grid for Harrisburg and relieve some of the pressure off of um, their system and then provide possibly low cost energy to local communities from our site. Another way is, which is probably the biggest way, is our farming. In our urban agriculture and the fact that we can grow 13 acres worth of, of in-ground farming food on just one third of an acre by going vertical. So that prevents people from having to continue to chop down trees and put farmland out there. Trees are one of the best ways to pull carbon out of the air and sustainable business practices, whether it's someone has a product, make sure they have the right packaging, you know, sustainable packaging, things like that. Educating our entrepreneurs that are, that are on site about these things. Supply chain management. So if you don't have to use a, a gas car or something like that, what, what are some other options? What are some other lines of distribution for you? And it's kind of just biomimicry, holistic approach, if you will, kind of <laughs> kumbaya is, but real. Just like, you know, just be mindful of what we're doing and know it, it affects Earth. Gary is working hard to counter a misconception about these types of innovations. I think sometimes sustainability gets labeled as like an affluent white issue. And then even in the black culture, then it's seen as the same thing. So, you know, solar panels on a house or water collection or composting or being plant based, or, you know, any of those things. It's like, well, that's that's not what we do. Well, like, what do you mean what we do? This is a human thing. We got to culturally shift our society. Gary explains how you can learn more and even get involved with the bridge. As an entrepreneur, Gary is quick to let you know how you can invest in the project. Go to thebridge.com. That's thebridge.com. Subscribe first and foremost, and then shoot us an email and let us know you're interested in investing. That is the case. This is a great way to not just have passive income, but a great way to have passive impact, affecting people's lives daily for generations to come, um, and also be able to set yourself up financially. And you want to give back, contribute. We've got a great team put together and you know, looking to expand and scale out of Harrisburg already consulting with multiple cities, mayors, municipalities. Learn more and see photos and videos at thebridge.com. And definitely check out the Green Sports Pod hosted by Lou Blaustein. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. I love about people like you pursuing solutions to address climate change, even when stretched by a challenge, you bounce back. This is definitely true of Sharona Schneider. She lives in Portland, Oregon, and is originally from Lagos, Nigeria. And like most of you listening, she keeps herself very busy. I'm a data analyst at a local apparel shop. I am also the independent contractor for a media company called Mafic that posts about sustainable lifestyles and like inspiring stories that are going on around the world. I typically am making the memes and the TikToks and like funny things that you see on their pages. Working on climate change requires determination and an open heart. Like many of us, Sharona has felt weighed down by the scale of the problems we are attempting to address. I felt it recently in Oregon when the smoke was covering our city and our state. It was hard to breathe outside. You could barely go anywhere without having serious impacts on your lungs and your health. It was a moment of defeat 
where I felt like I had been such an activist in my community and doing everything possible. By the end of the day, the way that our governmental system works enabled these fires to grow to such an extent where it was beyond my ability to mitigate or manage. That can be a really, really depressing fact. But I used it to motivate and fuel my action and continue to have hope towards a future where this is no longer a reality for us. With that same persistence and problem-solving spirit, Sharona came up with an idea. In early 2020, at age 20, Sharona felt all the pieces in her life were perfectly in place. She was excited about her life ahead. And then, the coronavirus pandemic. And it completely derailed every single aspect of my life. Definitely in quarantine for the first few weeks, started feeling very depressed. Just to be someone who is so involved in the community and to not, no longer be able to be in those spaces with those people and doing the work that I was doing was very depressing for me and gave me a lot of anxiety, just wishing that I was out there taking action in a physical and tangible form. After a few months of adjusting to the pandemic lockdown, one Tuesday, Sharona met up with a friend for a socially distant outdoor activity. Uh, Wanda McNeely and I started talking more and we started FaceTiming every week. We're both really big volunteers and wanted to get out in our community in some fashion, but do it in a safe manner. So we decided, why don't we just go pick up trash at our university park box? And that's a great way to get involved in the community, do something positive while also being distant. We realized, why don't we do this every week? It was so much fun. We got to see a huge difference in the community park. And then we realized, why doesn't everyone around the world do this? Since that first Tuesday picking up trash, they have started a movement that is taking off around the country and the world. Tuesdays for Trash events have started in six continents. We've seen people in Pakistan, America, in France, Costa Rica, in Ghana, in Nigeria, just everywhere around the world, except for Antarctica. We've seen people picking up trash, and we're only hoping to grow it. We just launched a chapter in Washington, D.C. We're hoping it's the first of many. Sharona outlined the many benefits that she sees are coming from these regular, socially distant trash cleanup events. It's the perfect thing. It's such a hopeful action. It makes you see that you as an individual have so much power in your community to make a difference. Every single person we pass by would say some sort of thank you or acknowledgement, a head nod, a smile. It was such a fulfilling moment just seeing that, like, the people who were trying to benefit the community were there to watch it unfold and watch it happen. People started joining us one event at a time, and it grew from there, them telling their friends and their family members. People got involved physically rather than just seeing us doing it, the more it grew. At a time when many of us feel disconnected to the world and each other, Sharona sees Tuesdays for Trash as a way to reground ourselves in the people and places that are most important to us. It's really important as well to just connect to our environment because it's hard to defend something that you don't love. By picking up trash, you're making that a connection with your communities and your natural spaces. It becomes something that you fight and are determined to protect because you love it so much and you love the benefits, whether it's going on a hike and experiencing the sounds of nature or the waterfalls. No one wants to see a waterfall filled of trash. She also points out that when an organization or a business gets involved with Tuesdays for Trash, it gives them valuable connections and credibility with the community. It's a great form of philanthropy that any brand and business can implement, and it's especially important because it's directly benefiting your local community. It's a great way to boost your reputation and just start going from there and then implementing more sustainable practices into businesses. Sharona sees Tuesdays for Trash as a way to engage people with issues they normally avoid. 
we don't want to just have it stop at picking up trash. Picking up trash is the gateway action towards more activism. On our social media, we post about everything and anything that has to do with climate justice, whether it's defining what ecocide is or how climate anxiety affects us or the ways that you can be more sustainable or greenwashing. With climate change, we're not just picking up trash and then making a positive difference in our communities and making sure that the marine mammals are taken care of and don't have more plastic in the ocean. We're also making it easier for you to learn how to be an activist and get involved in those spaces and communities that help support you and grow your abilities within that realm. The wonderful thing about Tuesdays for Trash is just how simple it is. All you need is a trash bag, gloves, and a mask. That's really all it takes. Just making sure that you're distancing yourself from others is the key when picking up trash. But otherwise, it's all stuff that you would typically have in your home. You can use gardening gloves. You can use any sort of gloves that you have. These days, it's so hard for local climate groups to get new members. There are almost no public events where people can table. We're not able to meet in person. So many challenges. So if you're looking to engage with your community in conversations about climate solutions, Tuesdays for Trash might be for you. By doing it, you will also learn more about your community and the needs that exist. If community members see you week after week wearing your organization t-shirt, they're going to get curious about this group of people who are trying to make the world a better place. And perhaps more importantly right now, gives us a chance to be with others. Even if you go out there alone on a Tuesday, chances are people will stop by to say thank you. Sharona tells us how you can learn more about Tuesdays for Trash. You can find us at Tuesdays for Trash on every social media platform and TuesdaysforTrash.com is our website. It has a lot of links to different ways that you can get involved, start your own chapter, or contact us if you have any inquiries. Thank you for joining me for episode 54 of Citizens Climate Radio. The show is written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. Other technical support from Ricky Bradley and Brett Cease. Social media assistance from Ashley Hunt Monterano, Flannery Winchester, and Steve Volk. Moral support from Madeline Perra. I welcome your comments, questions, and ideas for guests. My email is radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. Now, I could use your help with something. It's in getting the word out about our show. So please, when you have the opportunity, share Citizens Climate Radio with your friends on Twitter, Facebook, wherever. You can find Citizens Climate Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also listen at northernspiritradio.org. Join the discussion at our Facebook group page, facebook.com slash groups slash Citizens Climate Radio. Follow us on Twitter at Citizens C Radio. That's Citizens, the letter C, radio, at Citizens C Radio. Visit citizensclimatelobby.org slash blog to see links about our guest, find full show notes, and our Dig Deeper section. Citizens Climate Radio is a project of Citizens Climate Education. Join me and thousands of other climate advocates for the Citizens Climate Online Conference. It's December 5th and 6th. The United We Move conference will be offered on Zoom and will include practical and engaging breakout groups. Some of these breakouts include talking to conservatives about climate change, creating a welcoming space for Black, Indigenous, and people of color members, and bridging the political divide with braver angels. I will offer an interactive breakout session where we will envision climate success and begin planning our next steps. The conference is free, with sessions available on December 5th and longer breakout sessions on December 6th. Visit cclusa.org slash unitedwemove to learn more and to register. That website again is cclusa.org slash unitedwemove. I hope to see you there.
Hello, I'm Claudia Romo Edelman. And I'm Edie Lash. We're the hosts of Global Goals Cast, a podcast that asks how we can change the world. In every episode, we take on the world's biggest challenges from global warming, poverty, gender equity, good jobs, health, and education. And we don't just identify the problems, we find solutions and speak with people who are making a difference. And you can make a difference too. Mm -hmm. Subscribe to Global Goals Cast at globalgoalscast.org, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen.